On the agenda for tonight's meeting is the approval of the minutes of the previous meeting on February 24th, then a discussion of the normal high water line zoning amendment, and we will conclude with public comment of items not on the agenda. So to start, um, approval of the previous, of, of minutes of the previous meeting, do we have any discussion on the minutes? I have one picky thing. <laughs> Victoria's not here, so I'll pick. Um, Eric Hiltz's name is misspelled. There's no K on Eric. And I just figure since he's the applicant, it should be spelled correctly. <laughs> okay, thanks, Carol Ann. Oh, nice. okay. Any other discussion? No? Do I have a motion to approve? Move to accept the minutes. Second. Okay. Um, we have um, uh, moved by Joe Shalott, uh, seconded by Peter Curry. Do we have any discussion? No? Nope. All those in favor? Motion carries. Oh, was there an abstention? Any abstention? We have an abstention by Henry. Thank you. Okay. Next on the agenda is the normal high waterline zoning amendment. And to kick that off, I would like Maureen O'Meara to introduce the item and Sir. provide us a summary. Uh, and, and I wanted to probably need to point out that um, Liza Quinn is the acting planning board chair for this evening. Uh, Victoria Valent is uh, going to be arriving late. So uh, the item before you, again, is the normal high waterline zoning amendments. Uh, You've got a couple of things in front of you. One is just a very brief cover memo with a potential motion for consideration at the bottom of that. Then there is a, um, the actual text of the amendments. Uh, what you're proposing to do is to replace the bulk of the normal high water line of inland waters current definition, turn it into a normal high water line termed definition. Um, the way the normal high water line will be determined for inland waters, it will not be changing, but adjacent to tidal waters, you will be replacing the normal high water line definition that references the top of the bank cliff or beach above high tide with instead a definition that references the highest astronomical tide plus three vertical feet, plus there's also a definition of highest astronomical tide. I want to point out that the definition that's proposed has been reviewed by Peter Slavinsky, um, our scientific um, advisor from the Maine Geological Survey. And then there is a third piece, which is um, an amendment to the Shoreland Overlay Performance District that specifically talks about the tidal waters definition and references that there has to be a field determination of where the line is going to be. And I have the text of this amendment up right now, and I know that uh, Peter Curry has a proposed change, and I know that um, Victoria Valent has also asked for some amendments. So with that, I'll stop unless there's any questions. Okay, yeah, and under and for our consideration is what we would recommend to the town council. Correct. For their consideration. Okay. Um, any discussion among the board before we open this up to public comment? Should I explain my proposed change, or is that come later in the... I think now is fine. <clears throat> okay. Um, the, uh, the whole subject of the mapping of zoning districts, I'm sure we'll hear more about this evening from some of the commenters. They, it's certainly come up before. And uh, the regular zoning districts are very much map-determined for the most part. On the other hand, we have the resource which are very much, um, they are subjective in that one has to go out and inspect the land in question and you're looking for soil types and you're looking for plant types that are customary to wetlands. So the resource protection districts have a, uh, a very different characteristic to them and there is language in the ordinance which refers to the on-site inspection to finally determine the uh, the configuration of, uh, of the district. The uh, shoreland district we're talking about now is a little bit of a hybrid and the proposed language actually imported the language from the uh, resource protection districts to say that 
<coughs> the actual boundaries would be determined by the physical features present on the site. And that language in the Resource Protection District context refers to going out and looking for soil types and plant types. Uh, the proposed language we have for the ordinance, which is the um, uh, highest astronomical tide plus three, is, is nothing more than a uh, contour line. It's a geographic contour line. And so the what's growing or what the characteristics of the soils are, are basically irrelevant uh, to the inquiry. And so on that basis, I was a little, my personal view is I was a little reluctant to migrate that language from the Resource Protection District and have it apply to this. So um, I think what I, Maureen is now input up there is that the language would read, it would be determined from the field engineering determination of the topographic line, because that really is what the field work will be involved in. Uh, it will have nothing to do with soil types, uh, plant types, uh, splash lines from high tides or, or the like. So uh, that's what I'm, I will be proposing to uh, amend the language just slightly. It's a technical amendment. Yes, Henry. Okay, sorry. Now, are you proposing, are you going to show us this, this before you, the proposal, or is this, it's, this it's up there. proposed to change? Yeah, the, the, uh, the bracketed language would go away, and the blue language would be substituted for it. Yeah, I read the original language, and 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 um, especially after we got um, Sheila Mayberry's comment, I, I reread that section of our um, of our draft language, and I thought, well, physical features, the physical features on the site will determine where that contour line falls, essentially. And so I I, I thought it was okay. Um, I understand the rationale of your language here. My my only hesitancy about that, and um, I think Maureen would be um, a good source on this, is that if and when we were to move to a GIS system where we have maps that may not need to be field verified, I guess either, I guess either version would need to be altered. I mean, is that's, that right, Maureen? You know, we, we have GIS now, uh -huh. um, but, you know, there's there's a, a wide variability in the quality of data. And if we were to improve the location of where we depict our shoreland zone line, we would still rely on aerial photography. We would either use aerial LIDAR data or aerial photography. And both of that is still data that's generated by a plane flying overhead. And that's not as accurate as boots on the ground looking at something. So I still think that a field verification is, is a good thing to put in there. Mm -hmm. And you know, if we were to do something that was equivalent to a field verification, it would be to have someone literally walk the entire coastline with a GPS unit determining exactly where the this line would be. And I, I don't see us doing that in the foreseeable future. So uh, I still think the concept of tying the location of a zone line to the physical features is a valuable one. No, I totally agree. Right. And, and, I, and Peter's, <coughs> and, I, to, and I, wanted, I, don't, I just want to continue, that is not saying that I don't think that Peter's language isn't still tying things to a physical features. I think it's just two different ways to say this, get to the same point. So it's up to the board if they want to make it specific to a topographic line, which is what Peter is suggesting, or to go with the more generic physical features, which is the language we also use in the wetland regulations. But I mean, both of them rely in the end on, on some in the field verification. Oh, in the field, and my only, my only difference, it's not a big deal to me, is that there are just two very, very different field operations that will take place. One for the natural resource, 
area and one for this, and then you're just, I, I guess I had a problem using the identical language for mm -hmm. two such different uh, right. functions. Um, how do board members feel about the um, use of the word engineer? Yes. Caroline. Joseph, I thought Joe was going to go. Um, I actually like um, Peter's suggestion. I think it's a good, a good alternative. I like it because it's extremely specific. It basically says you got to get a surveyor out there and determine where that line is. So, I, I mean, I've always thought of it as a topographic line anyway. So, to me, that this makes a lot of sense. I have a question for Maureen. Um, does engineering connote a surveyor or a, a different level of? You know, if I think if we looked up definition of engineering, we would, we would get definitions that talk about how to make something work. So I don't think it has to mean an engineer. But again, you put that word in there, it's easy, it could easily be interpreted that you have to get a professional engineer out there to do the work. Could, could we substitute survey? Or how, how do people feel about using the word survey? A uh, field surveying de determination? Well, I mean, in our, it seems like in our ordinance, any, we, we now have the requirement for um, a survey when we're within 10 feet of a line. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that applies to a shoreland zoning line. So, and we all, all, we basically have it already, you know, almost no matter what we say here, right? The field engineer, it doesn't, it doesn't state what the qualifications of the person is, it just says through an for a field engineering point of view, a technical point of view. That's true. But, you, I mean, we are, we are really splitting hairs here. I am. Yeah. But the, the reality is that if we factor, if we put in the human factor, and you say field engineering, the, my guess is that most people are going to read that to mean an engineer needs to be involved. I can't tell you how it's going to be interpreted, if it's ever adopted. OK. Well, we can. Um, well, it distinguishes it from a contour line picked off of a map. Okay. No, I. You know, I think you're. We're, everything you're talking about is in is in the realm of what is reasonable. So, where you want to land on this is fine. Okay, and um, we. I mean, when we make the motion, is. When yeah, we'll we, I decide, mean, right. I put this up here because it's kind of hard to revise text in the middle of a meeting, and Peter had it already drafted, um, so I, I included it. But you may want to put on hold your decision to accept this amendment or not until after the public hearing. I, I yeah. think we should do that. Um, but while we have the text up there, Victoria had an, uh, two, two changes, minor changes. Yes. One I think you caught in defined, yes. and the other one was to insert um, the words or located after extending. Where? Just in that same paragraph. Um, so it would extending read or um, located. Yeah, um, or other structure extending or located. And Victoria's. Um, amendment was to match this language to the state definition. Was to what, sir? To match the language to the state definition word for word. Okay, are we ready for public comment? Sure. Great, so now I'd like to open the meeting for public comment. Um, people are welcome to come up to the podium. Please state your name and address for the record and limit your comments to three minutes. And Maureen, would you be willing to yeah. do the timing? Thank you. Uh, I take it that uh, you actually did read the comments that I sent in yesterday and today. And um, there were two questions that I posed today uh, in, in the email, second email I sent. One was, why can't language be included that the CEO must reference the official map because, in fact, that's what the ordinance does require when there is an issue with respect to the boundaries. Upon written requests by a property owner, 
town board or a municipal staff person, the code enforcement officer sh uh, shall determine in writing the existence of wetlands and the location of resource protection and buffer district boundaries based on the zoning map. This ordinance documents cited in the ordinance and similar materials and a site visit. But the first thing that, that the ACEO, I'm not talking about the one we have now or any, any CEO, must reference the zoning map. And it would seem to me that um, we should have something in that, that sentence somewhere that refers to the zoning map because clearly that is one of the most important references that, that a CEO must go to. So that's my first question. Why can't language be included that the CEO must reference the official zoning map? The second question I have is be, if the town is stating that our map is inaccurate and out of compliance, with the state mandate that it actually um, be um, equal to, I think it's one inch to 2,000 feet. If, that, if our map is not at that standard right now, then it must be updated. And especially if we go to HAS plus three. It, 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 is, it is inconceivable to me that, you, that the town won't do that. I mean, if the zoning map is what the CEO must refer to and, and that we all refer to, then HAS th plus three will really throw it all off, even if it's inaccurate today, which I debate that it really is. But if you say it is, it's gonna be even more inaccurate with this. It clearly needs to be redone. So my question is, why won't the town update the map at this critical time? So those are my two questions that I posed to you um, this morning. Uh, yeah, I think this morning, I guess it was. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, Acting Chair, Ms. Quinn, and Planning Board members. My name is Maynard Murphy. I live at 24 Pilot Point Road. Uh, last October, Peter Slavinsky did a presentation before the Planning Board on sea level rise. So I'm going to be referring to that a lot in this uh, talk. So I know he's been doing these presentations for various coastal towns throughout Maine for several years, and he's been offering suggestions for moving forward. My position is that Cape's current shoreland ordinance is more restrictive overall than HAT plus three or HAST plus three. I know that some coastal towns are moving to HAST plus some number, but, or HAT, but uh, they previously had a less restrictive shoreland ordinance than Cape does. I think ours is still more restrictive and therefore more protective of the environment. Uh, than what other towns are moving to. Also, there is only a 0 0.1 foot difference or 1.2 inches between the 2013 HAT number and the HAST number, I'm sure you're aware of. Uh, using HAST plus three may be problematic in the coming years because one, it uses national title datum EPIC 1983 to 2001 which is already 12 or 13 years old, and two, it won't be updated until 2025. Uh, so also, for the presentation, in the last 20 years, sea level has been rising 130% faster than predicted. So the 13-year-old data may well be outdated before it even gets updated. Uh, per Peter's Slide number seven, uh, sea level at Portland, Maine from 
1912 to 2013. This chart shows that sea level has been rising at a rate of 1.89 millimeters per year, or 0.63 feet per century, and that's about seven and a half inches. Uh, on slide 11, he, he spoke about, in Maine, this is the fastest rate in the last 5,000 years. It generally matches global changes over the past century. And uh, slide 12 said that in the last 20 years at Portland Tide Gauge, sea level rise has been rising 130% faster than the historical data and rising faster than global changes measured by satellite altimetry. So in the last 20 years at Portland Tide Gauge, sea level rise has been about 4.41 millimeters uh, or about 1.45 feet for a century, if you were to go out with that, or 17.4 inches. This tells me that the rate of sea level rise has been accelerating in the last 20 years in our region of the world. Uh, slide 15 showed that the global sea level is expected to rise from anywhere from 8 inches to 6.6 .6 feet by the year 2100 and they have a greater than 90% confidence level on that, those figures. Mr. Murphy, we're at three minutes, so if you could wrap up. Okay. Um, I guess I would just lastly say I, I urge you to be uh, prudent in your duties to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth and uh, do the comparisons necessary and then share those results with your citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Lori, why don't you put this up there? Can I, can you help me with that? Actually, I've kind of got this hooked up. What do you want to do? Oh, we can, can she not? I have to, I have, I have to unhook it. I think we should unhook it. Okay. I'm myself, so I'm not sure. You may want to just come get it. Oh, just this. Yep. My name is Deborah Murphy, and um, I live at 24 Pilot Point Road. And um, thank you, uh, Ms. Valent and uh, Acting Chair Ms. Quinn, um, for letting us speak at this public hearing. I have some information I'd like to hand out to you, and it has to do with what the public can see up on the screen. And I'll just hand it up now. We can share. Okay, I was trying to do what I could to help with understanding um, the accuracy of our current map because it is quite accurate at the scale that it is. It's a paper map and it has a graphical scale of one inch equals 2,500 feet. That gives you about a about an accuracy of plus or minus 2.67 feet. Once the map is adopted, that's the scale. And actually, if you look at this map, and we'll look at it on here, you can see where the shoreland zone runs in the middle of a road that's 50 feet wide. So the line is not all that hard to see. Um, and what I did on this handout is the transparency, the very first page, is actually the paper map information. So it's this map enlarged so that you can see it better. So this is the paper map and the data off of that. 
What's underneath it is the Google Earth image and the KMZ file sent to me by uh, Judy Colby George that came from Chris, and I don't, Maureen knows her last name, but I don't, um, who actually did our original Shoreland Zone, and we should be very happy that she did because she did a beautiful job. She hand drew that. And then the data points were digitized and put in a KMZ file so that we could put it on Google Earth. If you overlay this shoreland zone, which is this line here and these little dots, if you overlay it on this map, you will see that the existing current shoreland zone, which goes from this yellow line, the most landward line, to the top of the cliff, which is where most places in Cape, when you're dealing with rocky ledges, it's where the terrestrial vegetation stops and the cliff starts. And it's pretty easy to see. You'll see that the paper map lays over this digital map perfectly. It couldn't do that if it wasn't accurate. It wouldn't happen. So it's very, very accurate. The data set, it's based on the data set and it's accurate. Also, you're only looking at two, when you talked about layers and worrying about layers, the shoreland zone file is one layer. It's not many layers. The other layer are the tax parcels. The tax parcels upstairs on the right as you go into the um, assessor's office and planning office is at a scale of one inch equals 100 feet. One inch equals 2,500 feet is a very large scale map. It's very accurate and it's what the main geological, uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, geological survey uses so that people can find things as small as hiking trails. So on this map, this is the, the map that is underneath the Google Earth map with the overlay of our data. Um, this is Surfside Avenue, and it was something that Sheila Mayberry brought up at the last public meeting with the planning board. And it shows a lot that right in here, this lot, you can see the swimming pool. You can see furniture. If you look at our zoning map, you can see it on here, where that is and where it's in reference to the corner of this lot right in here. That whole piece, that yellow piece from the black line to the red line is going away if you use HAS plus three. Ms. Murphy, so, three and, minutes. Okay, I'll wrap Let's it wrap up. up. So in my neighborhood alone, which, if I can, oops. Zoom out of that. Sorry. In my neighborhood alone, the total square footage that will be removed from the Shoreland Zone is 164,269 square feet. An American football field is 57,600 square feet. That's the equivalent in my little neighborhood of Shore Acres of three American football fields. It is a lot. We would very much like to work with you. We've got some great information. Thank this you. is very accurate. And as Sheila said, in 1924, in our ordinance, the code enforcement officer, if something isn't defined specifically at a lot level within our ordinance or on the map, with um, specific footages um, when distances are not given upon the map or in the text the scale of the map has to be used so the code okay, enforcement needs to look at it so please please it's thank a you. significant we will address that. change your comments thank you Hello, I'm Jim Moore at 5 Wombeck Road. When I spoke here a couple of months ago about the need for vegetation between structures and the ocean for uh, runoff absorption, I could see there was a lot of conflict between the planning board and some of, the, some of my neighbors, where the planning board is looking at hat or has plus three feet, which seemed to be 100 year tide. And the neighbors wanting a more restrictive top of the bank where we've seen some wave action about once a year or so. 
So on the one hand, it seems like 100-year tide ought to be enough, and on the other hand, it seems like we ought to have, uh, we shouldn't have a change that uh, is quite a bit less restrictive than what we see once a year or so. So I tried to figure, uh, do a little research and figure this out, and I, I went to uh, the tide charts, which show up by AccuWeather.com, show up in the Portland Press Herald every day, and I take the high tide and the low tide for every day, uh, so far in March, at least the days that my dog didn't eat the newspaper, and I plotted all those out, and I can see that low tide is pretty well at the reference of zero, so that's either at or pretty close to the mean low water, uh, low tide. And the mid tide is about five feet, and the high tide varies from about eight to about uh, maybe 11 feet or so. But we really need to add wave action to the high tide, because at high tide, you're gonna have wave action. So when you got a high tide that, let's say on this particular day, on Saturday was 9.4 feet, you know, if the waves are four feet, then you're gonna have two feet above that, and two feet below that, you know, every five to 15 uh, seconds for the tides. And erosion can be expected from the highest wave at high tide. So I also plotted out that I get the high, high tide plotted out again from March 1st to, 1st to uh, Sunday. And then I uh, plotted out the expected highest wave for that day, half of the wave. And I get uh, anything from about maybe 11 feet to around closer to 15 feet. So erosion, and the high water line really should be based on the highest wave at high tide. And on March 1st, the highest wave on high tide was 14.9 feet, which is the highest point that I plotted out, which happens to be pass plus three. So we actually were at pass plus three for the highest wave at high tide on March 1st, just two weeks ago or so. But in a one year storm, 15 foot waves are common. So I kind of plotted out what it would look like if we had a one year storm for each of the days in March up to now, and I'm getting anything from about 16 feet to about 19 feet or so. Which is really what, we're, what I'm seeing, and a lot of my neighbors are seeing, and get a little picture here which shows, which shows the ocean over here, a little beach, some ledges, and then the top of the bank right over here, and all sorts of debris over the top of the bank that the waves had thrown there. We got twigs and logs and pieces of plastic and other pieces of garbage. So, and this, we see this about once a year, where the storm gets big enough and it throws all sorts of stuff above the top of the bank. So, other factors I didn't look at were the effect of the wave energy coming towards the, the land and actually uh, crashing against the rocks and the, the effect of slope that may, uh, that may make erosion a little further inland and storm low barometric pressure, which could actually raise the, uh, the actual tide. But all of these factors would actually cause erosion further inland than my analysis. So, in summary, the highest wave at high tide was most likely Hass plus three on March 1st. One year storm with 15 foot waves would have highest waves about 15, 18 feet above the reference, which is really closer to Hass plus six. 100 year and a 10 year and 100 year storms would be higher. We really need a high water mark closer to the top of the bank or maybe Hass plus six to have ample vegetation for a runoff absorption. Thanks Thank for you. three minutes. Thank you. Great. I think I had about 30 seconds left. Oh, sorry. I, I, it, it is a different point. It's not a point I that I wanted to raise. And it's basically I wanted to ask why language could not be added to grandfather the areas that may be disturbed by the new has plus three. So please consider language to grandfather that area oh, that would be lost. Of Thank you. Speaking once. Anyone else? No? All right. At this point, I'd like to close the public hearing and open it up for discussion among the board. Um, Henry, I know you wanted to address well, I, Some I of just the want to comment. comment from, sorry. I did, in answer to that last comment, um, when you look at the proposal, this was statement, <clears throat> the highest astronomical tide attached at Portland Head Light is 11 foot 6 plus 3 feet would be 14.6 MLLW. Given the 100 year storm tide level reaches 14.1, Severe coastal flooding is at 13 in Portland Harbor. Has plus three will protect against coastal. 
turning the page, hazards as well as establish a setback that includes the splash over effect of large battering waves that cause significant, that cause significant damage. So I think that the subject of your there with some, with some tide levels and some damage going level, uh, over, overflow levels, I, I think it is either something wrong with your data or that this comes from, you know, uh, from the science, um, Peter, Peter's science level. So I, I, I have to take, or I believe that I have to take the engineering and the science as being more accurate. And the other statement was that has is not something <clears throat> is is, project, is projected by the best the best minds in terms of uh, water levels that there are available, best experts. So if they if if they're trying to predict something for the future, they're going to give it their best estimates. So to tell to to say that. Um, <clears throat> that their estimates are incorrect means that we're setting, or somebody is setting themselves up above, uh, considered to be the best experts in the field at the time. So, you know, you have very little alternative but to take their statement that has is their assumption and their project, project, projections that this is what is going to happen in, in, over the next period to which they're, they're assigning the values. So, um, you know, to turn around and say that they're incorrect and we, we've come up with the wrong figures doesn't quite, doesn't quite gel. Thanks, Henry. Yeah, and I just want to add to that. We, we got some data of the top 25 storm tides for the last 100 years, and I think um, clearly they were calculated differently than the way you calculated yours, but there's only been one approaching 14 feet, and that was the blizzard of 78, and that's high tide plus the storm surge. So um, I think the height of the waves at the buoy when, when, where they're being measured is, is a different measurement, is my guess, than the storm surge, but then again, I'm not a scientist. Does, does anyone else have any comments? on the map discussion the and the need I, for field verification? I, one thing that I find strange that um, somebody stated a figure that we would lose, what it was, in a couple of playing fields. Um, and I'm not absolutely sure how you do the calculations, but that if that's the case, then you're in direct contrast uh, to the presentations that we've seen given by by the scientists and by the engineers um, that have shown quite distinctly that, that this is as restrictive, if not more restrictive, than the current, uh, than the current top of bank that we were using, so that we've been using. So, I, you know, I, I, it's like an expert says this and somebody else comes up and says, no, that's incorrect. I mean, you have to, we have to have verification of, um, of data, and as far as I can see, the science science field has verified the data quite normally, and we've and we've seen it shown on on maps and extensions of where it would lead to. In in my estimation, it's as restrictive, if not more restrictive, than the current current uh, system. Victoria. I was looking at the letter that um, Ms. Mayberry sent in, and you, you did ask two questions. And um, one of them was, why won't the town update the map at this critical time? And you'd made references to different sections of the ordinance. So I, I went back, and, and I'm looking at what we have currently on the books and what we're going to be proposing to the town council. And our new language talks about um, the actual boundaries of this district shall be determined by physical features present. And I looked at one of the sections that was quoted um, on 19-6-9, it talks about resource protection districts, which of course the shoreline falls under. And, and it also does say the actual boundaries of this district, however, shall be determined by field verification. And there was another section that was quoted in the letter, section 19-2-5A, location of resource protection district boundaries. And it does say, once again, that it is 
based, um, those boundaries are based on the zoning map. If the property owner or does not concur with the map, uh, the code enforcement officer shall refer the issue to the planning board for re review. And this is after the code enforcement officer would go out to field verify. So once again, we keep field verifying, field verifying. And then um, it comes back to the planning board if there's no agreement. And then it tells in section B what the planning board would do to try to determine this line. And it says the planning board will ask, is, um, can ask for additional information. And what we typically do is we turn to a soil scientist, somebody who does this for a living. And what they do is they will go out and field verify. So there's a lot of field verification that is still going to be part of this ordinance. So when I look at this map that we did receive tonight from Deborah, I feel that this will be field verified. That if there is, if this line, this HAS plus three, is not the line, we have it in the ordinance numerous times, numerous sections where they say it will still be field verified. That's why I am comfortable with proceeding and going forward with HAS plus three. I still feel, because it's covered in, in, in our ordinance in at least three places, that they will still go down to these sites when an applicant wants to do something in close to the shore, and they will field verify. And possibly they will find what you're finding as far as this map goes. But I don't feel it's, it's it, that we're doing anything that's less than what we have always done because we are certainly still trying to look into the activities of the tidal waves, the splash over, the storms. We're still trying to capture that. We're still trying to capture the fact that field verification is so important. So important that if the code enforcement officer does not agree with the applicant, it comes back to this board and we will turn to a soil scientist, a third party outside. And I just feel more comfortable that these changes are not so drastic that we may be giving up three football fields because I feel that they will get onto the site and field verify. And for that reason, I am comfortable with moving forward. And, and I don't see the need to update the map because it'll always be field verified. And so I just feel that it, it can stand on its own because of all the backing that we do have in the language and the fact that somebody will go out there. Can I uh, add a comment about the map? Because so much has been said about the map. One of the underlying assumptions about the zoning map, I mean, it's constantly referred to how the shoreland zoning passes through various properties and along various property lines. But the fact is, though, that's a, those are uh, tax map property lines. So the actual property lines shown on there are extremely inaccurate and really not useful as a basis for locating anything. I mean, if you have a dispute with a neighbor over whether something is on your property or their property, you would not refer to the zoning map to resolve that. You would get surveyors to mark to figure out where the property is. So, you know, I, I think this constant talk about the zoning map is really um, sort of counterproductive to what we're doing here. Thanks. Anyone else? I'll add again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is um, to answer the question uh, once again, why won't you update the map? And I went back to the DEP. So I went back to Chapter 1000, which I know you're familiar with. We've both been quoting from Chapter 1000. And it does say, if an amendment is made, then the map should be updated. But I looked for the definition of an amendment. And what I found is that when a municipality determines that special local conditions within portions of the shoreland zone require a different set of standards from those in this minimum guideline, the municipality shall document those special conditions and submit them for an amendment to the DEP. I think what the DEP is worried about when they hear special conditions is that it's weakening these standards and they want to look at what it is. I don't feel that we are looking at anything about 
our location that is special or different. I, I, I feel that we are keeping very much in line with the guidelines from the Municipal Shore Zoning Ordinance. Uh, we are doing exactly what they are saying, um, the purpose of why we do shoreland zoning. I don't think that they're going to see this as a special amendment that applies to just a local problem. We're not making anything as drastic that we would say this is a huge amendment. We're just trying to clarify language. The code enforcement officer says top of the bank, splash over it, where the top, it's just, it's not specific enough. And once again, that's another reason I feel that the changes we're making are, are not special or different, uh, that, that a, a new map needs to actually be uh, presented for the DEP's approval. Um, I think we're just tightening our language and we are still right 100% within the minimum guidelines and I would say that I would argue we're now trying to, with plus three, make sure that we are uh, getting closer to what we've always had, but now in language that's much easier for everyone to be able to feel, verify, and, and also understand. So that's as far as why we will not need, I don't believe, a new map. Peter. Yeah, and I have a, <coughs> excuse me, a slightly different slant than in Victoria, but I think we probably come out in the same place. The zoning map um, showing the shoreland district as it now exists under the current language of the ordinance, <coughs> excuse me, which is referred to the apparent reach of the uh, extreme reach of the tides, top of bank being only one example, is by its very nature a somewhat wandering line. And the, the present zoning map, I don't think, purports to track that wandering line as it wanders because of the topography of the land and whatnot. Um, so, in, in much the same with the resource uh, protection districts, they approximate its location, but, and that's about it. Um, and under the present language, of course, there is a, a field inquiry that gets down to specific stuff on the ground. Under the new proposed thing, the field inquiry will be to find the topographic line. So the map right now is, does, doesn't, is not purporting to be a precise location of the shoreland district. It approximates it. And the field verification was necessary to give it its actual configuration. And under the new uh, proposed um, language of the ordinance, it will be a slightly different process. Once again, there is an approximation of the shore of the seaward boundary of the um, uh, shoreland district. And, and the, uh, with, with the new definition will simply be going to a topographical basis rather than a physical uh, on the ground uh, determination based on tidal reach. Any more discussion on the public comments? No. Would you um, now like to discuss the proposed amendments that we have up here, again, that Maureen proposed um, now that you're here, Victoria? Mm -hmm. So, Victoria, we have three changes to the packet that we are given, two that you provided, four located and defined, and the other one in blue that um, Peter provided which is an, alterna an alternative that really separates um, shoreland zoning from resource protection language, makes a clear distinction um, between the two, and introduces the term field engineering determination. Okay. Good You're comfortable sure. with that? Yeah. Would anyone like to make a motion? Henry. It ordered the based on materials reviewed and the facts presented. The Planning Board recommends the normal high water line zoning amendment to the Town Council for consideration. Second. We need to decide whether to before. There's a one way to do it would be see as amended. Which, or you could, by consensus right now, say, you agree with this version that's right there. 
I agree okay. with that. Okay. Shall we take a consensus on uh, whether we agree with this version? I agree. All those in favor? Okay. So as amended. How many were there? I think, I think what Henry just said unanimous. is when he made the motion, it was intended to be this version. Correct. Yes, correct. Do you want me to reread so it? Make a new motion as amended and put, insert as Be it ordered that based on the materials reviewed and the facts presented and the amendments and the amendment amendment as agreed, the planning board recommends the normal high water line zoning amendment to the town council for consideration. A second. I second. Seconded by Joe. Any discussion? I'd like to make I just want to make a comment to explain why I'm voting the way I am. Um, we've spent a year discussing this. Both the public and uh, the planning board have put in a considerable amount of effort. Um, and we've researched with scientists, we've discussed, we've disagreed, we've agreed, we disagreed again. That's the planning board on that part. And, um, and it's been necessary to compromise. Do I think this is a perfect solution? I doubt it but I think it's better than the current language. So, it's, to me, it's a movement in the right direction. Therefore, I will be voting yes on this motion. Okay, so all those in favor? Motion carries. I wanted to add to Carol Ann's comments. Um, thank you very much for all your participation. Um, it, um, it, it, ha it made us um, review this with more rigor. And um, I think as a result, we have simplified the language. And um, we are also investigating, Maureen is our, also investigating, looking at putting shoreland zoning on GIS. Not that it won't require field verification, but it will be a more accurate map than what we have now. So thank you for your participation. All right, so for the last item on the agenda is public comment on items not on tonight's agenda. Do we have any? Great. Um, in working with the planning board, uh, it would have been helpful if there could have been a back and forth um, asking questions and answering questions, a discourse. Um, and I wonder if there's a possibility, and I know that there were members, Peter mentioned it, Henry mentioned it in different meetings, can we just ask questions, can we talk? When p the public gets to stand up and speaks for three minutes, and then you speak, and there's nothing in between, we could help each other out, and I think it's an important thing. And I base that, too, on sitting in the last planning board workshop where the public typically doesn't get to speak. There were three agenda items prior to the agenda item that many of us came to uh, hear about. In those, there were site plan reviews and the public spoke and there was a back and forth and you learn something and it's much quicker and, and everybody learns and I think people walk away feeling pretty good about the process. So I guess with something as important as a town-wide ordinance if ever in the future, I really think there should be a consideration that there is a either site plan review kind of process or something where there can be a workshop type of thing where people can talk to each other and that it's not a wall between us. Um, in that process because it really seems a bit draconian and it didn't serve the process well, I don't think. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think this is a new item, but you can shut me oh, down if it's not. Please your name and... Sheila Mayberry. Um, I propose based on... And your address. Uh, oh, pardon me? And your address. Oh, yes, uh, 30 Trendy Road. I do propose that a new zoning map be created, uh, especially based on your comment that 
um, the town planner is in, is considering uh, doing that uh, using uh, GIS and other updated technological tools that we now have. Uh, I think that would benefit the citizens of Cape Elizabeth uh, tremendously, especially if the town uh, council does pass the new definition. So that is my proposal. Thank you. Any discussion? Yeah, I, I, I can't really let it pass that at the workshop, which I ran, I allowed the public to speak on the site plan. I want to be clear is that I read before we start every workshop that, unfortunately, I can hear what you're saying. Unfortunately, we cannot take comment from the public. Anyone who's speaking at the site plans that we were looking at, they would have been applicants. I was not allowing, I, I wouldn't uh, not allow it at the high water mark discussion, but then allow it at the site plan. I, it's just not allowed, and I just want to make it clear, only applicants are speaking at workshops. And just to answer the, what you may have seen, just to clarify that. Thank you. Thanks, Victoria. Okay. Oh, Please state the, your name. Could I just I, I must say, I, I, I appreciate Deborah's point. I think I agree with it. Uh, I would like to, s to see at some point, think about our rules to permit a controlled dialogue. One of the problems is that it can get out of control very easy, and I totally appreciate that. But I think there are times when it would be appropriate, and I would certainly be inclined to think about ways we could permit it in the right case. And I just want to say, Henry, I, I agree with you um, when it comes to policy changes. So I like our rules when it comes to applications, but I think policy changes are different. And um, I agree with you. Thanks for making that point. Uh, Maynard Murphy, 24 Pilot Point Road. <clears throat> just to uh, carry on from where Mrs. Murphy was going, uh, could we perhaps in the future take a subject offline planning board and have a discussion about that um, rather than you know continuing to have the wall or have you guys say something and then we have information to say back about it but we can't say it because you don't allow it it, just, it just seems silly thanks thank you yes Henry um, when people had asked or made statements during during public meeting. They're, they're virtually questions that obviously go unanswered to a degree at that time. But I can assure everybody here that during our meetings, those questions and those, those uh, subjects brought up were addressed and researched and gone into. So when somebody claims that this would happen or that would happen, we've had presentations, which by the way are available to the public during the workshops. And we've asked the question of the expert. The expert has showed us the answers to those on there and satisfied to my, to adequately for me and I assume the rest of the board, that the questions and the opinions that were expressed were verified and checked and double checked by us. So I think we put a lot of work into it. And I, you know, I believe that we did an honest and as close to uh, uh, to an accurate and uh, fair decision that you could make. The one other thing is I think that at least if it passes through the council, at least the stick can be stuck in the ground and it says that is the point, not it's subject to some form of uh, um, whether it's this or whether it's that. There's a definite point in the ground and the rest can be argued from there. Okay, thanks Henry. Yeah, and I think maybe this is, um, and I'm only acting chair, Victoria's the chair, but this could be something we put on an agenda item for a workshop, because it may be that some back and forth might help expedite these policy issues. Um, I think the, the, the one way is um, slow the process down. Um, just my, my two cents. Okay, any more discussion? No, do we have a motion for adjourn? Motion by Peter. Second. Seconded by Henry. All those in favor? Adjourned. Thank you.
Tschüss.